So as you've heard me talk about in the past, there are a few different ways that one can become the CEO of a company. And our guest today took over from his dad. He's a second generation leader. And as a second generation leader, Bill Dewar took over his company in 2011 after kind of being thrown into the deep end. But along the way, he has built an amazing business. Now, how did he get here? And what was it like changing over, for, changing the guard from his dad to now what he wants to do? And how did he become this way? Well, we're going to talk about that today on How I Turned the Corner. So, Bill, welcome to How I Turned the Corner. Hey, Kendra. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. So tell us a little bit about what was going on in 2011 that made it possible for you to take over this amazing, this amazing role. Yeah. So, I mean, I had been within the company for a few years and Hatteras is a 40 year family owned business. So, you know, at that time we were somewhere in our late twenties, early thirties as a company. And, uh, I had started two years earlier in sales and, uh, you know, one day I got called into my dad's office and he told me I was the president and I didn't really know what that meant at the time. And I've kind of joked about it a few times. I think even though I may have had the title at the time, it's it took another five or six years before I really understood the role and started to see a bit of a transition uh, in the company. So I think it was it was probably premature, but I don't know that I would have had it any other way because it really helped me uh, be in some uncomfortable position positions and evolve as a leader ultimately. I think that's amazing. And then you got to you kind of hit your stride then as a leader right before COVID. Yeah, I did. I uh I got I've been part of Vistage, which is a great organization. I believe that's how we're connected. And it really helped me, you know, see things about myself that I didn't realize uh and realize you know, the things where I was strong and that I need to lean into and the things where I was weak and I needed to work on. And I think like all of us, you know, we get tested in those times of adversity and COVID was certainly a time of adversity. And uh, that's really when my skills as a leader got put to the test. And it was my job to make sure the company stayed a company and that our employees stayed safe. And we came out it on the other side, I think much stronger, more aligned as a company for sure. So do you mind being a little bit vulnerable with us and just sharing like how how much has your dad still stayed involved through these this period? Uh, I would say over the last 12 months, it's been less than ever, you know, more of a, a monthly connection with me and our leadership team uh, where we review kind of confidential financial information around the company get his opinion, you know, kind of give him high level updates on things that are going on. But I would say now the involvement is less than ever. And and from my standpoint, um, you know, he's done a tremendous job giving me a platform to build from. I, I feel very fortunate to be in the position that I'm in. Um, and just being able to take the reins of the company and, and make it my own uh, is really special and something that I'm grateful for. And the fact that he trusts me to take something that he grew from, you know, four people to 270 employees, you know, his identity is is very much wrapped up in, in this business. So for him to be able to step away uh, and, and trust me, I know that's difficult for him. But at the same time, I think there's part of it that is satisfying for him seeing me evolve and go through some of the same things that he went through in a different time and be able to evolve and persevere through them. And, you know, he's a phone call away. So I'm very fortunate in that way that I can still connect with him. I talked to him probably 20 minutes ago about something that was going on, but uh, yeah, it's, it's more of a, a step away than ever for him at this time. So with a little bit of hindsight then, and also being thrown in the deep end of the pool, at least twice, if not more, hmm. what would you say are some of them like, big shifts that are different between you and your dad in terms of leading? Well, I think, you know, I like to say that I'm, and and I take this, I grew up playing sports, right? And I grew up coaching uh, and I coached at all different levels through different points of my playing career. And whenever I was a coach or a player, um, I like to motivate. I like to motivate whether it was through my efforts on the field to bring the team along with me or as a coach to kind of get everybody to believe in themselves and realize that they're part of something 
greater than themselves. Um, so my, my style of leadership is very much like my style of coaching. And it's about motivating and breathing life into things and trying to get the best out of what you have um, and the best out of the people around you and getting everyone to see themselves and how they fit into the big picture. Uh, and my dad's style, while similar, I think the delivery is a little bit different. And I think a little bit has to do with a generational difference where maybe it was a little bit more passionate, um, direct, where I think I'm a little bit more creative with the way I use language uh, and a little bit more finesse. You know, I would say he leads with a lot of brute force and inspiration, and I lead with some finesse and inspiration. It's just a little bit different. And, you know, admittingly, as I get older, I realize that there are a lot of similarities between us where I think as, you know, not every day, but when I was, when I was younger, it was, it seemed like there was a much broader contrast between the two of us. So I also think the business being in different stages through our leadership is also requires different things. So to grow a company from the ground up, you know, through the 1980s and 1990s versus growing a company that has a very stable um, revenue stream and uh, history, you know, through the 2010s and 2020s, it's, it's, it requires two different styles. So for us, it's, I think, created a good transition for the company where everything he did and the way he did it was necessary based on where the company was and the time it was in, where now it's, a different time and the company's in a different place and a different leadership style lends itself well to that change and kind of fostering it into the future. Totally agree. And, and it's, it's not at all a disparaging comment. It's uh, cause it leadership is just different now. And we just, we have to be different now because our staffs, our staffs require that where in those days it wasn't necessarily the same way. And I mean, the technology, all of the various things now, the access to information is so much different. And so it requires a new leadership for sure. And um, I mean, what have been some of the trends that you've been experiencing? You, so you're on the Jer New Jersey coast or on the, on the East coast. Yeah. Like, what are some of the things you are, you are seeing with, with uh, employee being a boss in, in that area? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the, the things we're challenged with is we have a very diverse workforce, right? So we're manufacturing printed materials and that requires kind of a service organization on the front end and then a manufacturing environment on the back end. So we have these very, you know, eclectic contrasting workforces and different challenges that we have to solve for across the board and different things we have to accommodate based on the competitive marketplace when we're looking for new employees. So, you know, on the front end, we're talking about things like remote work and work, work life balance. On the back end, we're talking more about um, apprenticeship programs and job training and mentoring and how we bring people up through the organization. Um, so I think for us, it's a pretty dynamic environment, but we're realizing, you know, we may not be competing for the same employees as, you know, your Googles and your Facebooks and your big tech companies. But everyone has become accustomed to seeing and hearing the amenities that some of those employees who work there have. So we as a company have to bring that forward for our employees. So this place where they're spending most of their waking hours is also exciting and rewarding and something that they can be proud of to, to come into and say, hey, they work for Hatteras and our company does all these great things for our employees and for the community. Uh, and we also can, you know, also work and get a paycheck here. So balancing all those things out, I think is a challenge, um, but it is required of us if we want to evolve and grow. Um, so I think I gave you a pretty roundabout answer there, but there's no, a lot of factors that we have to, that we're considering at all times. Yeah, no, I think you brought up a couple of really key things. I want our listeners to call out. <clears throat> the first one is that, is that you may not be competing with, like like you said, the Googles and Facebooks, but you are competing with Amazon. Who's competing with those? And Amazon is not always the best, you know, best employer. So if you can be an employer of choice through the things you're doing, the environment you're creating, you actually are more competitive than some of those big companies. And um, and a lot of times, smaller businesses actually have 
a desire and an ability to be even more agile than you'd imagine. Um, and so, so no, I think that's a, that's a really good point. And I love that you're doing that. W what are some of the programs that you have in place? Like, what do you, what are some of the things that you hear from your staff as being just making it a great place to work? I mean, we do, we try to do a lot of little things. Um, you know, recently something new that we did was we brought in uh, a breath work coach and she held a three hour session for a group of our employees um, during the summer, we do fun stuff like, you know, an ice cream truck comes every Wednesday. We have an acai bowl company come in once a month. Um, our admin team is also running a big cornhole tournament for our employees. So as far as like activities and small little touches to give back to our employees, I think those are a few of the things that we do. Uh, we also do a lot of community participation so right now we're running uh, a toy drive for an organization called Live Like a Unicorn. They do a summer toy drive. Uh, we're also uh, working with uh, Clean Ocean Action, which is local here in New Jersey. And throughout the year, we do a few beach cleanups, which is great to get us in, involved with the community. Um, so those are some of the, the little things we do. And then I think some of the more foundational things right now, we're reevaluating our employee benefits package. We recently just uh, revamped our 401k to give the employees uh, a better program there. Um, and it, it varies, but I think just putting a focus and an emphasis on it to ensure that we're constantly doing things to create an ecosystem where people can be, hey, our company did this great thing or our company is doing something fun. Um, it all kind of collectively comes together to create an energy within the business where, yeah, people are showing up every day, they're doing a good job. And there's also a little bit of fun to be had and and some putting the company to work for a good purpose at the mm -hmm. same time, it all comes together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I love that. The um, Another way I would call out some of those things that you're doing is you're, you're creating an environment where people can like each other. And, and it can be more of a community inside your company and not just be a place where people are going and just slog, you know, slogging through the work, but actually enjoying things a little bit more and having a little bit of fun makes it that you then are tend to probably like your colleagues a little bit more. So I would agree. Great. I would agree. I think, you know, our environment is very, we're supporting a lot of uh, big corporate sales and marketing efforts or supporting their supply chain to make materials or packaging or whatever it may be. So it's a, it's kind of a fast paced reactive environment and being that we're doing custom manufacturing, you know, not everything always goes according to plan. So always troubleshooting and pivoting and being able to kind of collaborate in those moments of friction, you know, having a safe place to do it where, you know, Hey, these are my colleagues and we can, we can talk through these things because we're going to go, go play cornhole at lunch and like, cut loose a little bit later, it it helps foster a, a safe environment for people to troubleshoot and share. And it makes it okay. Like there's going to be friction. There's going to be discourse. Let's just know we're all here to accomplish the same thing and solve problems for our customers so we can have a great place to come and work to work at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's um we were saying before the show started about the printing industry. So I, I I don't know if a lot of our listeners know that I actually came from printing. They probably know that I was a software engineer because I've talked about that before. But where I learned and cut my teeth was in printing. And we were what the ones that put together the software that helped with the whole manufacturing environment of producing print. And so I'm <clears throat> very, very familiar with all of it probably too much. Like I can still identify something that's been printed on toner or with ink and like, <laughs> you know, that crazy geeky stuff that you do when you're a printer. Yeah. But um. So, so for our listeners, like it's a very, very diverse skill set as well. Like you have people who are running these big, big, sometimes offset presses. I don't know if you yeah. have that, right. Or yeah. big pieces of, you know, heavy capital equipment, as well as then equipment that breaks down and you're hitting deadlines there. These are very important deadlines. Usually like you can't slip them always. So it can be a very high stress situation. And then on the front end, the selling cycle is difficult. The margins are super thin. I don't know if that's still the case, but that's how it was in our days, right? And so you're always trying to find ways to just keep your profitability high enough you can keep running. 
do you tie, this is where my question ties in. Do you tie this, you know, are you seeing that your profit margins are higher because of the environment you're creating? Have you ever measured that? I don't believe I could give you a direct one-to-one correlation on that. Um, the thing I could tell you is that, and I'm, I'm making general statements here, but we're, we're fortunate right now. We're very busy as a company. And I don't think that's the trend across our entire industry. So I think what we've done between our, our marketing with our social media, uh, you know, there, I, our logo is the Hatteras lighthouse. You can see it here on my shirt. So I, I told our marketing team that our social media is our lighthouse. It's always on. It's there when people need it. So whether that is uh, a, a future employee, a current customer, a current employee, a future customer, a supplier, we are we are broadcasting an energy uh, that makes that attracts the right people to our company. Whether it's people who work here, people that want to work with us, or people that want to support us as suppliers, you know that ecosystem. I think builds momentum over time. And I think for us, that's been a differentiator in the marketplace. And the the buyer of today, once they get a cold call from a salesperson and that company and that person's name become familiar enough, probably the first place they're vetting us out is through our social media. So whether they go to LinkedIn or Instagram or our website or Facebook, they're gonna see current content. They're gonna see a vibrant company uh, they're going to see interesting stuff coming to life. And we try to have fun with that. And I think that energy that we broadcast through our social media that we put out there, th- it comes across when you walk into our building. It comes across when you meet with one of our salespeople at a conference or a trade show. It comes across when you speak to an account manager on the phone. And I think that in itself is something I can't really tie because I did this, I got this much business or I got this much more profitable. You know, I just know based on our year over year growth, the performance of the company, the fact that we're continuing to attract the right people. Um, I think all those things that are hard to measure are laying down the right results for us. Hmm. I agree. I agree. I mean, I still keep my finger on that, on the printing industry and people are not doing well. There are bankruptcies and there are companies going under all the time in the industry because the margins are so thin and and the capital requirements are so huge. And so um, it's just not an easy business to be in. And it has not died. Like I look at my desk, like everything is printed still. So, right. It hasn't all gone to digital. So there's still people printing. And I think it's a lot because of what you've created over there. That's, that is, you know, keeping you guys just thriving. Yeah. And I think with print, you know, it's I the last podcast I was on, I joked, it's something everyone takes for granted. Right. And what I've seen change over the years where a lot of, you know, what we do day to day, um, marketing materials, sales materials, those things are changing more versions, more personalization, shorter runs, quicker turnarounds. Um, they're never going to go away. But that part of the business is a little bit more threatened by digital, digital advertising, digital marketing, where recently, the last five years or so, we've shifted more of our focus to include packaging and the folding carton, which is more tied to the supply chain and the product. So, you know, we're not forgetting where we came from, but we're moving to another area where we've already invested in a lot of that infrastructure We've then gone out and invested in the people who know that side of the business. And now that we've, we have the people, we've already have the equipment. Uh, now we're just developing all the processes and we're now we're bringing in folding carton business, which is more predictable. It's forecasted. It's less reactive than the traditional sales and marketing side of the business. And for us, that's part of our strategy going forward is to bring that kind of fast paced service oriented nature that we've built ourselves on from the commercial business is bring that to the supply chain. And that's a breath of fresh air. And it's given us a little bit more stability and something to really focus on as we go forward. So, you know, being creative within the framework of what we have as a company to offer and the opportunities that exist in the marketplace, like that's really my job is to help bridge the gap and help our employees see like what we're moving towards so they can, again, see themselves in that big picture 
and understand how they can make a difference to the company's vision as we go forward. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really want to applaud you for that because I think my experience in the industry too is that people were so stuck in their ways. You know, it's like, oh, well, we've always only bound books this one way or we've only used, you know, the, we're only an ink shop or only a toner shop, right? So I was speaking a little print talk here, but the fact that you have created an environment where it's like our goal is to provide great customer service um, and and how and and then be able to respond very rapidly. I mean, look at how easy you can then adapt to quick changes, like being able to bring in the full, you know, bringing in the packaging. I mean, that's awesome. I don't again, like a lot of your competitors are not able to respond that quickly. Yeah, and part it, of it's because of the staff. The staff doesn't respond quickly. Like they're like, I don't know how to work this machine, and I want to learn how to do it. So why do we? Why can't we just go back to the way things have always been done? <laughs> yeah, and I think that's that is one thing that you know my dad did did create in the culture originally is pe the get it done attitude. We'll figure it out. We'll say yes. We'll find a way. Like that is ingrained in the people of Hatteras, and we're, you know we're really fortunate. We have. We have a lot of longevity in the company and then we have a lot of kind of up and coming talent and this very, again, eclectic workforce of those people who've been here for years and they raised their family here. And now the next generation of, you know, people coming into the company who are building their careers here and, and there's a good, um, you know, good aura about the whole thing. Just like you, right? Yeah. Being the second generation. Yeah, exactly. I love that. Exactly. Wow. Well, so what are some of the things that kind of keep you up at night? Like what worries you right now with the business? With that, no, not with the two little two smaller kids, right? But yeah, well, now I'm sleeping right now, which is nice. Uh, so the girls are the girls are sleeping through the night. Um, so the things that keep me up, I think, are it's mainly related to people. I mean, my job is to try to figure out how to get the best team on the field, right? If I, if I go back to my coaching analogy and make sure people are in the right place so they can be successful. So I think the people part of it is always the most challenging, right? Like usually if I buy a piece of equipment, it may be over advertised as far as the speeds and everything go, but I generally know what I'm getting. I think as much as you try to give yourself tools to prepare you for interviews and you know, measure the people that you're talking to before you hire them. You don't really know who you're dealing with until you go through a, an unexpected event, right? It's through some adversity. And then you tend to see kind of everyone's true colors. And that's, that's a challenge, right? Like you think you hired one person and six months later, you found out you got another. And I think that's one thing that I'm really working on right now is what can I do to get us more aligned operationally? Uh, and what can I do before that person steps in the door to make sure I know or we know as a company who we're getting and how we can communicate with them effectively, uh, what kind of coaching they need so they can kind of flex a little bit and work on those weaknesses uh, and just not be disruptive to the organization. How do I more effectively align our team so we can navigate change more effectively without drama. So mm -hmm. I think the challenges really for me are people, people oriented. Mm -hmm. I can help you with all that. I mean, we can talk through a little bit about that right now, actually, because um, there is a formula and I think a lot of, it, it's, it's not going to guarantee in that the sense of that you're not going to, humans are complex, not uh, complicated. Like a machine is complicated. Humans right. are complex. Right. You can put an assembly line together to create something very complicated, like an iPhone or whatever, and it will guarantee the same outcome over and over and over. Never going to be the way with people. Right. However, what I've learned is the, probably the most important thing in my journey of running a business has been getting really honest like really honest around what are the behaviors you expect from your employees? Like not what looks great on the wall, not that's just the stuff that shows up in the handbook, but, but like really honest about it. And in small businesses, smaller, I mean, any business is less than a thousand employees. The leader is going to be the one that drives it. That's just the reality. Like there, I've, I've worked with hundreds of businesses now. You can't skirt around it. It's going to come down to you 
and your leadership team around what are the behaviors you're expecting and are you are you living that or not? And then you want to hire and fire and manage and train and govern, promote, compensate everything against those behaviors. But then how do you get really clear on those behaviors? That's the hard work. And so, um, and so there's a, you know, really fun, like, you know, event or offsite that we run to help the leaders get really clear on that. And then how do you turn that into a recruiting strategy? And then how do you turn that into your onboarding plan? Or as we say on belonging, because mm. onboarding is like kind of gets confused with just orientation, but how do you really on belong someone so that they belong to those behaviors and they're demonstrating them? And then what happens when people get off track? And how do you handle it? How do you hold them accountable? How do you actually have intentional conversations around it so it's not so stressful? And uh, and so that's that's a lot of the work that we do. But yeah, that it, there is a formula. Thank goodness for it. Cool. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that a little bit more. Mm-hmm. For sure. Because, yeah, we can totally do that. Yeah, I think it's just uh, it's a big challenge, you know. And with a with a company with all different walks of life and skill sets, I think there's. You know, you can make one wrong mistake and it can haunt you for the next couple of years, you know, so just oh, yeah. uh, and I think for me as a young leader, and this is part of something that I've come to realize about myself, you know, when you're a second generation leader um, and you're somebody who's wanted to, you know, earn your spot and then you get put in a position where it was kind of handed to you. I think that's always casted this doubt in my own mind. Um and it, it was hard for me, especially being younger than a lot of the people within the company who are now under my care to have the difficult conversations with them, because I think something that was in my head, it may not exist for everybody. But, you know, when someone's older than you, they should know more than you or they should be they should understand what they're accountable for. And I think that's not always the case, um, but also as someone who's always learning, right? You want to at least know what that person is expected to do before you address them as, you know, not being effective at their job. So I think for me, there was always a lot of hesitancy to have those difficult conversations because I felt like I wasn't in a position that I should have been in, like kind of that imposter syndrome piece that some of us leaders struggle with from time to time. But as I've turned the corner on that, I've been willing to have more difficult conversations and put myself in more uncomfortable positions. And at the end of the day, the more difficult conversations that I'm willing to have, the more effectively the business runs. So a lot of times it's just like facing that thing that you don't want to face and realizing it needs to be addressed because if you, the leader are seeing it, chances are everyone else is already aware of it, you know? So, so that, true. yeah, it's just something yeah. I've come to grips with. Yeah, for sure. And, and by the way, it's not an uncommon thing at all to have a, a little bit of that feeling of imposter syndrome. I mean, we, I, I think any, every leader has it to a certain degree. It, and if you, if you say you don't, you have blind spots then. <laughs> and so, um, cause we all have that head trash as leaders around this stuff. Like, are you doing enough? Is it too much? Is it what, what's the right thing to do? Or am I, I mean, all of the things that can come into play as a leader. So that's not unusual at all. And right. also it's a skill to have those difficult conversations. It's something that it can be learned for sure, but it's not, it's not easy for the majority of the, of the world, actually. Right. <laughs> You're definitely not alone. Yeah. No. <laughs> so not very few of us grew up in an environment where difficult conversations were a part of our upbringing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Most of our parents are just like, cause I told you so. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and we can't lead like that now. <laughs> it no. doesn't work. No. <laughs> oh gosh, Bill. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. I think that's a perfect spot for us to end. I know we can keep going on and on and on. So, but thank you so much for sharing just a tiny bit of your insight today on what it's been like to be a second generation leader and, and how you're growing this business and doing kicking butt at it as well. Wow. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much. I really appreciate being here. Thank you.